Our house does not have a garage. We have a carport, which means that whatever's happening in the great outdoors, a little piece of that is happening in our carport too. So for instance, right now, the cars and the bikes and the storage cabinet and, and the shoes left by the side of the door, everything is covered in what? Pollen. It's beautiful. It also means that uh, all of those accidental spaces that get created, like, um, like underneath discarded helmets or in the way that old car seats kind of stack up on top of one another, those become spaces for birds to build their springtime nests. And so we've got one right now that's like right at head level as you walk out the door, so you got to be careful. Um, the first time this happened, or at least that I can remember this happening a few years ago, I think this bird must have built its nest like overnight in secret, like it was a stealth mission. Because one day there was no bird, the next day there was a bird, and the bird made its presence known very quickly and very often. Because every time I would come out of the kitchen into the carport, or every time I'd go over to the shelf to get something to work in the yard, this bird would explode out of the nest and fly right at my face, like kamikaze style. And I think it was even like saying like, ah, as it was coming at me. Okay, this bird, uh, even like, even when I caught on and like started to kind of tiptoe out of the house and walk the long way around to where I needed to be, this bird would fly out of a dark corner and come right at me. This bird was a total jerk of a bird. But I was excited to tell my daughter Caroline about it because my daughter Caroline loves birds. She is always pointing out where birds are when they fly by the window, when they come on the porch, when we're out and about. She's always showing me where the birds are. And so I knew she was going to be excited to hear that a bird was living in our carport and that she would want to know that there was a nest built there and that inside the nest were four little blue eggs waiting to hatch, four little jerk birds. <laughs> and, and so when I got to the school that day, when I picked her up, I told her, I said, Caroline, you're, you're not going to believe it, but there is a bird living in the carport. But Caroline was not excited. Caroline was mad at me. Because she thought that I was making it all up. She thought I was like pulling a prank on her and making fun of her and playing a joke, which apparently is the reputation that I had kind of built for myself with my three-year-old daughter at this time, which says, you know, that's a sermon for another day. But um, so she didn't believe me. No matter how much I was trying to convince her and say, no, I'm, I'm serious. There's a bird living in the carport. She didn't believe me. So we got home, and I made sure to pull into the far side of the carport, and I walked around to her door, and I pulled her out of her seat and kind of held her high up on my shoulder, and I pointed, and I said to where the nest was, I said, do you see the nest? And she said, yeah. And I said, see, I told you there was a bird living in the carport. You should trust your father. And she said, I want to touch the eggs. I said, well, <laughs> Uh, babe, we can't, we can't go touch the eggs, okay, because I know you want to, but look, there's a mean bird that's sitting on top of them that wants to rip your nose off your face, so we can't go touch the eggs. And she said, I want to touch the eggs. So I kind of sighed, okay, I mean, if this is, if this is what it's going to take for you to believe me, and I went and got a, a trash can lid to kind of use as a shield and to hide behind, and and I said, okay, now, don't be afraid. Don't be scared, okay? Daddy will be right here if you get attacked, okay? <laughs> and I sent her on her way. <laughs> when was the last time you were asked to believe something that you just knew there was no way that that was possible? When was the last time that you had to, you had to make a choice about whether or not to trust someone who was telling you something that you were just sure wasn't true? Because I think for a lot of people, it was not more than just a week ago on Easter when millions of people around the world gathered in rooms like this one or in like a room like the sanctuary down the hall, and they listened to someone stand up in front of them, maybe a minister, maybe a member of the church, stand up in front of them and say that the one who had been crucified and dead and buried a couple days ago was back, was walking around and talking just like anybody else. And some people, they heard the pronouncement, Christ is risen, and they jumped straight into saying, hallelujah. But, you know, other people kind of lingered around a little bit and said to themselves, maybe, 
okay, well, then where is he? And so a lot of us, I think maybe even here in this room today, we are, we are all kind of like Thomas was on that first Easter because we are like Thomas who was not there at the empty tomb. He didn't get to see the grave clothes piled nice and neat the way that Peter and John and Mary got to see. Thomas wasn't in the upper room with the other disciples that first time that Jesus appeared and, and breathed on them. Thomas was absent. He was somewhere else. And so all he had to go on was a story that his friends, that the other disciples came around and told him when they came and found him and they, and they told him the story that, that Jesus had been resurrected, that he was back from the dead. And Thomas isn't so sure about that. It seems a little outrageous. Thomas is a little bit skeptical. Thomas needed to touch the eggs, right? Or in his case, he needed to touch the wounds that were in Christ's hands and in Christ's feet and in Christ's side. And you know, in my opinion, I think Thomas gets kind of a bad rap from this story. Because what, do we all, what word do we always attach to Thomas whenever we talk about Thomas? Doubting. Doubting Thomas. And we kind of forget about the two other times that he shows up in the Gospel of John where Thomas is really being pretty bold. Like the time when Jesus found out that Lazarus, his best friend, had died, none of the other disciples wanted to go with Jesus to Mary and Martha's house because it was in Judea. And the Jesus movement was not so popular in Judea, and the other disciples were afraid that they might get attacked, that they might get ambushed. So they didn't want to go. But Thomas stepped forward and said to the disciples, come on, let's go with Jesus, let's go so that we might Die with him. And then just a short time later at the Last Supper, when Jesus was explaining to the disciples that he was going to have to leave them soon and he was going to go ahead of them to prepare a place for them in heaven, Thomas speaks up again and says, Lord, we want to go with you, but how can we follow you if we don't know the way? But see, we don't call him brave Thomas. We don't call him bold Thomas. We don't call him following Thomas. We call him doubting Thomas. And the way that this story is so often played out and described, Thomas gets kind of trotted out there as an example of, of a weak disciple, right? He's the one who didn't believe in the resurrection. What a doubter. What a bad disciple. And the lesson that we're often invited to take away is that we should just never question. We should never doubt. We should just believe. No matter what, no matter how bizarre, no matter how strange the story from our friends sounds, we should just believe. But is that what we have grown to think that faith is? That all that faith is about is just believing one thing or another is a fact, no matter what? Is my faith measured by how authentically, how honestly I can recite the words to the Apostles' Creed, and not doubt a single word of it? Is my faith only rock solid when I've reached that point in my journey where I have no more questions, where I'm not thinking about anything, where I just believe it all, no questions asked? Is that what faith is really about? Because if that's the case, I got to tell you, my faith has a long way to go. And I would bet that maybe some of yours does, too. We've got Confirmation Sunday coming up in a few weeks here at Dunwoody. And, and Confirmation Sunday, I think, is one of the, the best Sundays in the whole year, in the whole life of the church. Because it's a Sunday when, here at least, we'll have about 90 young men and women who will come at some of the worship services, who will come and stand before the congregation of people, most of which they've never spoken a single word to, and will declare that they want to follow Jesus and that they want to be a member of this church. And it's an amazing thing to be a part of. And, and, and a part of that process here at Dunwoody, in the weeks leading up to it, the confirmands, each of them gets to have a 20 to 30 minute interview with one of the clergy to talk about their faith. And I'm sure that this is something that that they look forward to like Christmas morning. I know that they are just, 
they are so excited to come and to have to sit in a room alone with one of the ministers and to talk about this stuff. And I've done, I've done six of these interviews so far, and I have talked about everything with these, with these kids, on a range from like softball to video games to, um, to, the, to the wonders and glories of the Vitamix blender. And one of our sixth graders wants you to know that he is in the process of building a Vitamix ministry. So look forward to that in the future. We're going to have blends out in the hall as you come in. It's going to be great. Eventually, we do get around to talking about faith, though. We don't just sit on Vitamix for 30 minutes. We talk about their faith. And I I always ask them a question when I get to kind of near the end of the time together. I always say, is there anything you're kind of still wrestling with? I mean, do you have any questions about anything that you've been talking about at church on Sundays and Sunday school? Is there, is there anything that you just, you still, maybe you just don't quite buy it? And so far, every time I've asked that question, each one has said, no, uh, I, I understand it all and I believe it all. <laughs> and I know that they say that because they think that that's what they're supposed to say to the minister, right? So I kind of press them a little bit and I say, are you sure? Like nothing, no questions at all. Nope. I'm good. And I, and I say, wow, I wish I were that way because, you know, I've got a million questions. Like, I wonder, did God, did God really make the earth stop spinning for Joshua? Because I'm not a physicist, but I kind of I feel like that would be bad news for most of the people living on this planet if it were to just stop spinning all of a sudden. And did Peter, did Peter really walk on the water? And if my faith is just the size of a mustard seed, could I really take Stone Mountain and move it somewhere else if I wanted to? And I'll say, you know, you may be shocked to hear this, to hear me say this, being a member of the clergy and all, but you know, there are times in my life when the thought will race across my head, what if none of this is true? And I'll kind of lay that out there to them, and then so far, each confirmand who just a minute ago was certain of everything, had no questions, each one will say, well... Actually, I do kind of wonder about this or about that. And what I say to each of them and what I would want us to know and to remember is that, you know, you do not have to be question free. You do not have to be doubt free to be a member of the church. In fact, I would say the bigger your questions, the deeper your doubts go, the more we want you here. Because this is not a place for people who've got it all figured out. And that may surprise you when you look at your neighbor and you think, well, they look like they got it together. They've just figured out how to look like they've got it figured out. But this is not a place for that. This is a place for people who are still working to try and figure this stuff out and who have a desire to do the figuring with a group of other people who are trying to figure it out too. I think that more than worrying about Thomas's questions, more than trying to erase the doubts from Thomas's mind, I think what Jesus' main concern was in this story was making sure that Thomas stayed connected with that early Easter community of faith. Because God knows there are going to be times in our life when we find it hard to believe in him. And that is why and that is when it is so important that we can believe in each other Because there are going to be times in our lives, times in our journey of faith, where faith is just going to be really hard to come by, where we're just not going to be sure, where we're going to have questions, and we're going to need to be with a group of people who are in a different season of their faith, who can come around us and say, look, I know you don't believe this stuff right now. I'm going to believe it for you, though. I know you don't feel like singing the hymns today, but I'm going to sing them for you. I know you don't feel like praying at this point in your life, because you don't think anyone's listening, but don't worry, I'm praying for you and I'm praying with you and we need to have that community we need to be faithful to that community of faith we don't know why Thomas wasn't there that first time Jesus showed up maybe he really was having a crisis of faith maybe he really decided you know I just need some time on my own I need to get away from the group I need to really sort this stuff out and maybe he he chose to leave on his own but maybe you know, maybe the other disciples just got kind of tired of him asking questions all the time, and they, maybe they made him feel not so welcome. Maybe it was just his turn to get the coffee. We don't know. 
what we do know is that when the disciples had that first encounter, had that first experience with the risen Jesus, the first thing that they did was they went and they found Thomas and they said, Thomas, you're not going to believe it. There's a bird living in the carport. You're not going to believe it, Thomas. Jesus, he's alive. We saw him. He's back. And the great thing, the remarkable thing about Thomas is not, not that he had doubts, but that in the midst of his doubts, Thomas came back with the disciples. Even though he didn't believe a word that they were saying, he believed enough in them to say, all right, well, I'll come and I'll be with you. The remarkable thing about Thomas is that he remained a part of the Easter people even when he didn't believe in the Easter story. And so that the next time when Jesus showed up, Thomas was there. And Jesus was able to say to him, Thomas, look, come. Come put your hands here in my hands. Come put your hands in my side. Come and refind your faith in the sharing of a remembered pain, in the sharing of new life. And Jesus said to Thomas, no more disbelief, believe. And that's how it read in the text in the version that we had this morning. But another way that you can translate those words is that Jesus said, don't become unfaithful, but faithful. And faithfulness, at least in Thomas's case, had as much to do, if not more to do, with his willingness to to remain a part of the Easter people, even in the midst of his doubts, as it did his willingness to eventually believe in the Easter facts. And so maybe what this story is trying to teach us this morning, this story about Thomas, is that the opposite of faith is not doubt or uncertainty or questions. The opposite of faith is just no longer showing up. I mean, doubt and questions and skepticism and uncertainty, Jesus doesn't mind all that as long as we don't just keep it to ourselves at home and stay away from the church. As long as we bring those doubts back into the community and wrestle with them together, Jesus is okay with that. So blessed are you, you you Easter people who wonder and who ask and who question and who doubt and who are still working to try and figure this thing out and who are still seeking the proof that you need. Blessed are you who, in spite of all of that, have the faith of doubting Thomas, who have the faith to keep coming here, to keep showing up, to keep being a part of the Easter people. Amen.